This event is being co-sponsored by Brooklyn for Peace and also for Greenpeace. So for tonight, we are going to be talking about the whole range of problems involved with the new war on ISIS and Syria and Iraq and refugees war, which is that Phyllis directs the new international project at the Institute for Policy Studies. She's been a writer, an activist, an analyst, uh, a fellow at the Transnational Institute. She's written 11 books. OK. So Saturday, it turns out, is the 25th anniversary of the US invasion of Iraq. Not in 2003, but in 1991. Remember that one? The one that lasted only a few weeks, very few US casualties, so we didn't hear very much about the huge numbers of Iraqi casualties, and led to 12 years of crippling sanctions that led to the death of 500,000 children, et cetera, and in many ways set the stage for the next iteration of the crisis. How many of you have heard this meme that's out there? ISIS was started when Obama withdrew the troops from Iraq. I didn't say, did you believe it? I said, how many of you have heard it? Not true. I mean, you all know it. That's why you don't want to admit that you've heard it, because you know it's not true. ISIS history is not that complicated. It has a, very, a beginning. It doesn't yet have an end, unfortunately. But it has a beginning that was not in 2011 when Obama pulled out the troops. It was in 2004, in the first year of George Bush's occupation of Iraq, when the origins of ISIS, it was called something different, <clears throat> and there was, you know, it's gone through a lot of changes of names and changes of identity, but the organization that became the ISIS that we know and hate today was created in 2004 as one of many militias that were fighting against the US occupation and against the US backed Shia-dominated sectarian government in Baghdad. In many ways, that can also be traced back to the war of 1991. So the history, when we look at the history of what is US policy in the region, we can't just start with today. We can't start with Obama's State of the Union speech last night. We can't start with any of these immediacies. We can't start with Bush after 9-11. We have to go back. We have to go back very far but at least as far as 1991, when it, the Cold War is collapsing, George Bush Sr. makes a judgment that here's the way to show the world that with, with or without our Soviet sparring partner, we are still the superpower. What way do you do that? You don't have a press conference. You go to war. <laughs> and that became the basis for going to war. So what we're facing today is a set of intersecting crises, intersecting global crises. This new war is what George Bush used to call it, the global war on terror, the GWAT. Uh, Obama, on his first day in office, said, we don't want to use that term. We would like to call it something a little more benign. So we're going to call it overseas contingency operations, quite Orwellian. But the bottom line is, this is the continuation. This is global war on terror 2.0, if you will. And it's significant because it's very different in the nature of the war. It's a war. But it's not the same kind of war. It's, I mean, we could go into all the analysis of counterterrorism versus counterinsurgency and Petraeus versus the other guys. But it's not about that. It's really about, are there massive numbers of US troops on the ground, which means if there are, there will be massive numbers of US casualties? Or do we outsource the casualties? Doing what they used to call during Vietnam, changing the color of the corpses. So that the people who die are Iraqis and Syrians and Afghans and Palestinians and not Americans. So that's the choice of the nature of war. That means that we rely on small numbers of troops, relatively, still 10,000 or so in Afghanistan, <clears throat> about 3,000 in Iraq. Officially, there's about 50 special ops forces in Syria. We don't know how many are really there. Maybe they don't wear boots, so they don't count boots on the ground. They wear sneakers because they're special operations in CIA. We have no idea how many are there. <laughs> But this is a global war, which, the, yes, the US is the dominant military force. But the horrific role being played by all the other military actors, from the regime in Damascus to the Iranians and the Russians to the Saudis and the Qataris and the Jordanians, all of them are making everything worse. Because at the end of the day, this new kind of war is also failing. Because the lesson that they haven't learned is that you can't bomb terrorism out of existence. You can only bomb people. You can bomb people, and sometimes you might even hit a terrorist. You might kill them. 
but that just creates more terrorism. You can't bomb terrorism out of existence. Terrorism survives wars, as we've seen. We have been at war against terrorism since 2001. And terrorism is thriving. People are not doing so well in those wars. Not in Iraq, not in Syria, not in the surrounding countries, not in Afghanistan, not anywhere. But you can't bomb that out of existence. It was interesting in the State of the Union the other night to hear President Obama recognize the degree to which people are so frightened by the threat of terrorism. And that terrific article in the, in the New York Times this morning that sort of deconstructed this huge gap between the chances of actually being the victim of a terrorist attack for people in this country, which is one in something like 2.9 million, versus what people think is the fear of terrorism, which is massive. It's just, it's a huge divergence from reality. But then the article went on to say, but of course, the, the government can't challenge that. Well, that's our job as a movement. It's not our only job, but it's a big chunk of what we've got to do. We've got to educate people about what it means to say, yeah, could there ever be a terrorist attack? Yeah, there could be. There was one in, in uh, uh, North Carolina. No, not, I'm not getting to San Bernardino yet. There have been other terrorist attacks in this country carried out by people who live and were raised and born in this country, carried out by white people so they don't call it terrorism. And there's also terrorism like what happened in San Bernardino. So yeah, you can't stop every act of terror, particularly if people are prepared to die for it. You can make it a lot less likely. You can't necessarily stop every bit of it. But you can stop carrying out the actions that create terrorism. You all remember, looking around the room, most of you, not luckily, you guys are doing good at bringing in some younger people. Not everybody will remember, but some of you, most of you, still a lot of work to do, most of you will remember right after 9-11, anybody who said the words root causes was immediately branded a supporter of terrorism. That was unacceptable, because if you were trying to understand it, it must mean you support it. Instead of recognizing if you're serious about stopping it, making sure it never happens again, you damn well better understand it because otherwise you're going to fail. Well, they didn't, and they did. They didn't understand it, and they failed. They went to war and thought that was going to work, and it doesn't work. The new escalations that are now underway between the, the, the new fights that are going on between Iran and Saudi Arabia, which have far more to do with traditional regional uh, uh, concerns about military control, oil control, money control, who's the dominant hegemon in the region? Is it going to be the Saudis, or is it going to be the Iranians? That has been going on for some years. It's escalating right now, and that makes everything else more dangerous. The air wars that are going on, the US air war, the Russian air war, they are devastating people. They are devastating cities. None of it is making anybody better. None of it is helping. It's all making it worse. Now, the reality of terrorism as we're seeing it playing out in the Middle East now and the, the, the rationale for the so-called global war on terror, right now is grounded very much in the war in Syria, which is not a, ci a civil war anymore. There was a civil war aspect to it, and there's, that aspect remains. But this is now at least eight separate wars that are global and regional as well as national. But they're all being fought to the last Syrian. So when Saudi Arabia goes to war against Iran in Syria, it's not Saudis and Iranians who are dying, it's Syrians. That's taking place across the region concentrated in, in Syria. And the consequences of that are horrific, and you know some of them. The millions of people that have been forced to flee their homes, four million that have been forced to flee their country, the numbers of people that are being held under siege, by all the various forces, have besieged people, holding people who are now starving to death. I mean, luckily yesterday, the UN got some food into three different towns. That's not enough. There's got to be an end to that war. And that means an end to that set of wars, because as I said, this is not just one war. That's why it's all so complicated to even imagine what the diplomacy might look like. The fact that there is diplomacy on the table this is great. This is important. This is potentially worth something. But we cannot be anywhere close to complacent. One, that this whole process based in, on the 
uh, Vienna talks is going to go forward, two, that it's going to work, three, that it will be maintained. We can't assume any of that. But we have to be looking not at how do we combine our military with other aspects of US power. We, you know, we hear something from President Obama which is really important and right when he says there is no military solution. The problem is he acts as if there was. <laughs> Because every action that he does is a military action. And then he adds the part that isn't true. He says, well, the military part isn't enough. We also need diplomacy. We need negotiations. We need humanitarian assistance. We need this. We need that. The problem with that analysis is that it ignores the fact that it's not just about the military side isn't enough. The military side makes those other things, diplomacy, negotiations, humanitarian assistance, impossible. Imagine you're a, living in a Sunni community in Iraq, and you've started looking at ISIS a little differently because they at least claim that they're defending your rights against this incredibly brutal sectarian government that the UN put in, uh, the, sorry, the US put in power and keeps in power and arms and backs in Baghdad, right? So you're starting to look at ISIS as maybe being on your side. You don't like what they stand for, you don't like their extremism, but they're Sunnis that are defending Sunni rights. That's one of the reasons that ISIS has become so powerful, is that they don't fight alone. But so what happens? The US goes and they bomb a Sunni-based ISIS camp. And say they got it right, they almost never do, but imagine, let's, let's give them credit for something they've never done. They manage a bombing that only gets ISIS militants, there's no civilian casualties, it's very narrow, it's, they get the people they're, they're going to, and what happens back here? Yay, we got the bad guys. And what do they see? What do people in the city see? Yeah, there's the Americans again, going to war for the Shia and the Kurds against the Sunnis. We better stick with ISIS. So it perpetuates exactly what the US recognizes they need to do, which is to win people away from supporting ISIS. By going in militarily, it's creating an even greater problem. So that's the kind of failure we're looking at. Now, I don't have time. I'm, a lot of you are very familiar with some of the other failures, the more dramatic failures of these efforts to supposedly, we're going we're gonna to create and train uh, a group of Syrian, uh, Syrian fighters who are going to be loyal to democracy and loyal to us all at the same time. And they're not going to fight against the regime. They're only going to fight against ISIS. Oh, yeah, how, how'd that work for you? $500 million. And look what they got. They got nothing. They got bupkis. So there's a lot of reasons that I'm not going to go into now because we don't have time about the reasons for this war. A lot of them haven't changed since George Bush went to war. George Bush Sr. and George Bush Jr. Issues around oil, around power, around the expansion of US military uh, power. We go to war because the US government tells us the choice is either war or nothing. It's what Bush said the day after 9-11. It was 9-12, the day the world changed, when Bush said, we either go to war or we let him get away with this. It was a lie then, it's a lie now. So when we look at sort of the origins of ISIS, again, you know, there's a long history here, but the US occupation, the US invasion of Iraq, the US imprisonment of thousands of Iraqis, the torture of Iraqis, Guantanamo, all of the prisons where torture was going on on a regular basis, that's what gave rise to ISIS. That's what we have to look at when we say, why are they fighting like this? That's the origins of it. That's the origins of it. It's not, it's not all that complicated. The military escalations that are underway now threaten the potential that we saw with the diplomacy that led to the Iran deal that set the stage for the possibility, not the inevitability by any means, but the possibility of a new diplomacy-based rather than war-based policy in the region for a while. All of the new escalations, the US escalation, the Russian escalation, all these escalations are making that much more dangerous, putting it at much greater risk. The question of what are the interests of each country are key. There's not a country participating in this war in this so-called coalition we don't need a coalition of the, of the killing. That's what we've had in the past. We need a coalition of the rebuilding. But all of the interests of these governments is not in protecting their, their proxies, whether it's in Syria or in Iraq or anywhere else, in Afghanistan. It's to maintain their own power. 
That's true of the US, that's true of the Russians, it's true of the Iranians, it's true of the Saudis. Their human rights violations at home pale before what they're doing or allowing or encouraging their proxies to do in these wars. So this is what we need to be looking at. Now I have, and in, in the book is done as frequently asked questions. So one, one of the last questions is, so what should the policy be when a group like ISIS is so violent? Don't you need some kind of military? The problem is how violent they are doesn't tell you what's going to work to destroy them, what's going to work to undermine their influence and their power. What we've seen is that going to war against them encourages their power. It makes it greater, not less. It's not working. We need to do something different. I outline an eight or nine or 10 part policy of what the US policy should look like. We can talk about that during the, uh, during the, the um, question period. But the final point I want to make, and this is also the, the last question in the book, is what do we do as people? What do we do as a movement? It's not enough to say, stop the bad stuff that we're doing that's making everything worse. We start, what should the policy be? Start with the Hippocratic Oath. First, do no harm. Stop killing more people. Stop the bombings. Stop the drones. Stop the attacks. You're killing more people, not less. So stop that. But then, it's not enough to say, pull out the troops, pull out the bombers. We have to talk about what is our obligation as citizens of the country that has become this empire that is fighting to dominate this region. We have a lot of work to do. And it means education, it means advocacy, it means mobilizing opposition. It's not easy. It's not easy. What we've seen is that people in large numbers are often not prepared to fight against US wars unless there are US casualties in large numbers. And the strategy of the Obama war is to avoid US casualties at all costs. So when you make it into a drone war, you make it into a special ops war, you make it into an airstrike war, you're not having a lot of, of US casualties. There's still a few happening in Afghanistan because there's still 10,000 troops on the ground. But in large numbers, no. And so people are not prepared at a moment of crisis, economic crisis, political crisis, and fear when fear takes hold, and we're seeing this in these election run-ups right now more than anything else, at that moment, it's very hard to convince people that they should be worried about what US bombers are doing across the earth, where they're not killing Americans. That's our challenge. But it hasn't changed. The fact that ISIS is now one of the parties on the ground, you know, we heard a year and a half ago, we have to go after the regime in in Syria because it's the worst thing that ever existed anywhere. It's a terrible regime. The US has relied on it for torture and for, for maintaining the Golan Heights, etc. But it's a terrible regime. But do we really think that militarily going after that regime is going to do better, like Iraq? But we have to get beyond the notion that we have no obligation to people that are struggling for freedom and liberation. We have huge obligations but they don't include militarization and occupation. We have to be the creative ones to figure out how do we reach other people? How do we do that education? How do we do that advocacy? How do we do the mobilization work, the protest work? How do we get people to engage and recognize that it is all of us? None of us are free until all of us are free. And that's an international reality. It's not just here. Thank you. Everybody rolls with their fingers crossed. Everybody knows the war's not over. They know the good guys lost. And everybody knows the game is fixed. Poor stay poor, rich get rich. That's how it goes. That's how it goes. That's how it goes, that's how it goes And everybody knows Everybody knows the boat is leaking They know the captain lied And everybody's got that broken feeling Like their father or their 
dog just died and everybody's talking to their pockets. Everybody wants a box of chocolates and a long stem roll. Everybody knows. Everybody knows. Everybody knows. That's how it goes. And everybody knows. Everybody knows it's now or never. They know it's me or you, and everybody knows you live forever. When you've done a line or two And everybody knows the deal is rotten Those black folks still picking cotton For our ribbons and bows Everybody knows Everybody knows Everybody knows the plague is coming. They know it's moving fast, and everybody knows the naked man and woman are just a shining artifact of the past. And everybody knows the scene is dead, but they're gonna put a meter on your bed that will expose, that will disclose. That's how it goes. And everybody, 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 everybody knows. So that course is Leonard Cohen's great song and for many years I could not bring myself to sing it because it's it's just the darkest song I know but but then I I figured out a way to, to sing it I had a, a revelation that um, as things get worse my plan has been to get more and more optimistic out of sheer spite I'm seeing And I've been wondering about some things I heard Everybody crying Mercy when they don't know the meaning of the word Bad enough situation and sure enough getting worse with everybody crying just as just as long as there's business first Toe to toe, touch and go, and it's give a cheer, get your own souvenir. You don't even have to turn on your TV to see something plain absurd. With everybody crying Mercy When they don't know The meaning Of the word Well it's straight ahead And it's knock them dead Oh yeah And it's Pack your kit 
choose your own hypocrite. People running round in circles, wondering what we are headed for. Everybody crying. As soon as we win this war Straight ahead Knock them dead Pack your kit Choose your own hypocrite You don't even have to turn on your TV See something plain absurd With everybody crying Mercy When they don't know the meaning of the word 